Welcome to Retire Hour, the weekly show discussing income planning, investing, tax planning, estate planning, and Medicare. Complete retirement education. Hear from our financial advisors, CPA, estate planning attorney, and Medicare advisor every week. This is Retire Hour. Hi, and welcome back into a bonus segment of Retire Hour. Yes, I'm not Matt Goolsby. I'm Rick Everett, but I'm along with Matt Goolsby, and we're on location at the home show. Welcome in, Matt. Hey, it's great to be here. A lot of stuff to see here. A lot of stuff to see, a lot of people to see, a lot of people stopping by to see us and presenting questions to us. And we're here to answer those questions, aren't we? May I take it away with a question? Fire away. Okay, so if you're a regular listener to Retire Hour, we ask you all the time if you'd like to submit questions to us on our website, which you're welcome to do at any time. But here at the Home Show, we've been taking some questions from people that have just been stopping by our booth. And so we've got one from Lori, who stopped by. And here's the question, Matt. Are there common mistakes that retirees make when they first retire? And if so, what are some of the solutions for those mistakes? You know, that's a really great question because there can be so many things that you can actually have as a misstep when it comes time for making the transition to retirement. One of the ones that are immediately coming to my mind is Social Security. And yeah, I don't necessarily mean when or how to file for your Social Security, whether you're eligible for spousal benefits, or maybe if you're a survivor or often ex-spouse's record, those are all considerations you want to factor in. But I bet you can guess where I'm going with this. Taxes are a big thing that a lot of people don't think about until they go file that tax return in the spring. And then they realize, oh, my social security became more taxable because of this, this, and this. So we always like to walk people through the different options they have for social security but also the taxable impacts uh, that other income can have on your social security. Matt, would it be safe to say in your judgment uh, as people are approaching retirement or going into retirement that the tax rules change? Their taxes can be very different in retirement because like I mentioned, social security, how much of your social security will count as taxable income is based on what other income you have. And the more other income and the other different types of income that you can have can have a big impact on how much you'll be paying on your social security in taxes. Now, you're a financial advisor. How much tax advice can you legally give? Well, as my compliance officer says often, I'm not a CPA, so I better not be giving tax advice. So instead of just telling someone, you know, we, we can refer you to this person or that person, we actually have those people we work with hand in hand in our office. So we'll bring them in and have them join the conversation and figure out what those are. So back to Lori's original question, that's a pretty common mistake I see as far as when it comes time for starting your social security. You always wanna look at the taxable implications of it. And having a team in-house, Matt, uh, you're not having to refer these type of questions out to a third party where information could get lost or not relayed properly. Absolutely correct on that. Most of the time we've heard from other people that are working with other financial advisors, well, well they can't help them with tax questions. And you think about this, Rick, how can you really make an, an educated or informed decision if you're not factoring in what tax consequences could be there. So when somebody approaches you in a consultation, a first visit, they're just coming and, and getting to know us, you're getting to know them, and these tax questions come up, is that an opportunity right then to address them in real time? And sometimes that's all the time, they, all, all the, maybe the only chance we have talking with that person because they only needed answers to that question. And yes, we bring those professionals in and we get those answers there. and. Maybe that's all that person was really lacking in their plan. And we, we really like helping people and making sure they get the answers to their questions. So uh, sometimes that's just where the conversation begins and sometimes that's just where it ends. Tell people how to reach out if they want to get in touch. Well, you're just wanting me to say that 800 number. <laughs> it's 833-888-4687 or that's 833-888-HOUR or pop on over to the website, retirehour.com. Matt, our next question comes from Neil, and the question is, how do I decide when to take Social Security? <laughs> well, it's part of a bigger conversation. Is he married? Is he single? Does he have dependents? 
Is he, uh, are they all out of the house and grown up? What other assets are there to maybe complement or help supplement his income and social security? When we're looking at income planning for the people that we help, we reverse engineer it. We say, okay, how many dollars a month do you need to live on in retirement? Then we take a look at what are the social security strategies? Is there any options there? Should one spouse wait to take it later? Should one spouse take it earlier? It's a bigger conversation that we have and, and it seems like with everyone uh, individually, there's a little there's a little differences because everyone's thumbprint is unique to themselves, right? Mm -hmm. But when we take people through that process, we get to know them and figure out what is the income need in retirement, how much of Social Security is gonna cover that, and then when you take money out of the other retirement accounts, what kind of taxable implications does that have on its Social Security? Matt, another visitor to the home show stopped by by the name of Harold, and Harold asked, how do you decide the best mix of Roth and individual or traditional, I believe is what he was looking for, IRAs? Well, Harold, that's a great question. Um, normally, this is where I'd pull in a CPA because it is going to be a little different and unique for each person. And back to that income need. If we can get enough dollars over in the tax-free portion, the Roth IRA, before you start taking Social Security, it can help us immensely control taxation on Social Security going forward through retirement. And it just gets back to that plan where a lot of advisors, financial advisors, will focus on income planning. And believe me, that's important. You also need to look at tax planning on that income planning. And that's a lot of times missing from people's retirement plan. Another visitor that stopped by our booth here at the home show was Mike T. And uh, the question that he asked is, what are market advisory groups fees and how are they determined? Excellent, excellent question, right? If you don't know what you're paying for investments, I encourage you to find out. We do that entirely complimentary as just a visit in our firm. But it's important to know what we may charge. We actually have a fee range. Obviously, the more you have, the lower the fee gets. You can go find that on our website at marketadvisorygroup.com right there on the homepage. We have a fees tab that gives an idea of what kind of benefits and features they can get and what range their fee may be in as far as uh, based on how much assets they have to invest. Another visitor to the home show stopped by, Matt, and her name was Sheila T. Her question was, your company has an in-house tax team. What are the benefits of that connection? Well, um, if you like surprises come tax time, I would say you don't want to work with a tax team. But if you want to plan ahead and you want to look at tax planning like we do every year with the people we help in October, November, and December, the benefits of working with that tax team show you if a tax plan when we work through it in the, in the late fall to early winter. And, you know, let me ask you this, Rick. If you owe money to the IRS, do they charge you interest? Oh, yeah. But if you overpay them, they certainly give you a nice rate of return on all that money they've held on for the year. And, and then they'll return it to you when they give the tax return. Oh, no. Oh, so maybe there's a benefit there to making sure that you're not going to owe and cause penalties and interest. But on the flip side, you're not going to send in too much so you don't give an interest free loan to the government. Those are just one type of many examples there that uh, you have a benefit of working with a tax team in house. Now, Matt, you, along with other partners in the firm, wrote a book, the book called The Investor Catch. What's it about? Where can people get a copy? Well, just like most things in life, when they sound really good to be true, you're always like, what's the catch? Well, that Investor Catch book that we wrote, uh, I think it was in 2017, we wrote that book to tell the, the retirement population that there's fees that can be happening in their accounts and they really need to know what those are because it's not uncommon for someone. In fact, I met with someone just yesterday. Their fees on their account was 3.15%. Mm. And this gal, she had around $150,000 and that's a lot of money. It can add up big time. And she had no idea she was being charged that. So it's so important to know what you're being charged in fees. We wrote that book, it's an easy read. It starts to get you to think about the different fees that could be happening out there and what are you really getting in return for those fees that you're paying? Because oftentimes it's not much. Another visitor to our booth at the home show, Aaron stopped by and the question was, how do you protect your assets after your pass so that your kids don't burn through the money? Well. 
uh, I need to be careful on this one because this <laughs> is probably a, a, a question where we'd pull in an estate planning attorney and ask them what options were available to the individual on what types of protection they would want there. But there can be a number of different tools and strategies as far as maybe a trust or maybe um, different entities there. But again, that would be something for our attorney to talk with them about and go through with their unique situation. Because like we mentioned earlier, everyone's thumbprint is a little different and everyone's situation might need something a little differently. And being at the home show, we get a lot of visitors to the booth and the questions are all very different. So here's another question that comes our way from Steve W. And that question is, I need help with Medicare sign up and Medicare coverage. What do I do? There's all kinds of 800 numbers flying around out there on TV ads. As Corey Hebert, one of our Medicare advisors will often say, if you call those 800 numbers and you get on their lists, you almost need to go and witness protection because they are going to hound you for the rest of your life. If someone has questions about what plans or what options they may have for their Medicare options, I encourage them to come in and talk with our Medicare team. Uh, they will routinely explore the different options there and, and how it may get covered differently from one plan to the next. There are certainly big differences between Medicare Advantage and Medicare Supplements. It seems when we meet people, you don't normally have a good opinion or a bad opinion. You have a strong opinion one way or the other on Medicare Advantage, and that's fine. But everyone's health circumstances are a little unique and different to their own. That's why our team takes people through a process, showing them if they go this direction, this is what their coverage options may be, or going this direction, they may have uh, saved some money. So it, it, it's really unique on everyone, but Corey and, and Mark and Trey and Taylor over there at the Medicare team and Grayson, they encourage you to come in about two to three months before you're gonna make that transition to Medicare so that you have enough time to digest and explore those available options to you. Another visitor to the Retire Hour booth here at the home show stopped by by the name of David E. His question was, I'm not retiring, but my, 50, or my 65th birthday rather is coming up. Anything I need to do before that birthday? Well. Probably not, but needs to know some more there. Medicare will not penalize you if you have what's deemed as credible coverage. Most group plans do count as credible coverage. But I'll give you an example. Someone the other day, they're on a, um, a health sharing plan with their work, and it makes that person go to Medicare at age 65. So David E., I believe, is the one who asked the question. Mm -hmm. David, I would recommend you to come in and meet with our Medicare team, even though you may not be needing Medicare until you fully retire. It's also nice to see sometimes Medicare can be cheaper than your coverage at work. Oftentimes it's not, but it's always good to make sure of that because if you could be saving money, don't you want to know as soon as possible if you could be saving money? Very true. Got another question. It's kind of a shot over the bow from Susan B. Kind of a broad spectrum, a broad spectrum question. But the question is, is capers taxable? Well, as my <laughs> compliance officer says, I'm not a CPA. I'm just a financial advisor. I better not be giving tax advice. But generally speaking, capers is not taxable for the state of Kansas income taxes, but it can be federally taxable. Just again, based on your unique circumstances, situations, and we'd want to bring in a CPA to see what's going on in your income. And if you're married, that could have a, a difference as far as an impact on how much in taxes you'll be paying or single. So it's just a question where we want to involve a, a tax advisor in the situation there to make sure they're getting the most information to make their best educated decision for them. You know, Matt, it's been an absolute hoot to be out here at this home show the last several years. And we really do get a wide variety of questions from people that maybe have never seen us or people that see us every week or listen to us on the radio or on the podcasts. It, it's kind of neat to interact with all the different questions. What's really nice is meeting the people, whether it's someone that's coming in for, an, for a visit with us because they've listened to it on the radio and they have questions about their circumstances. It's so great to meet all these different people and, and hear their story and help them get answers so they can have a better or more secure retirement. And just a reminder to you out there, we answer listener questions like this all the time on Retire Hour. Visit the retirehour.com website, click submit a question. You can choose a piece of free swag just for doing yeah, so. Look at all this stuff. We got, you know, uh, a jacuzzi, a, a pill, pill box, a flashlight. We got hats, coffee mugs, umbrellas portable battery chargers, spatulas, uh, chip clips. I mean, what? I guess we don't have the kitchen sink. 
but we've got stuff to go all around it. <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, I, I need to make a promise to the regular listeners and viewers of the podcast of Retire Hour that I'm just here for this special episode and you're going to be in the driver's seat from here on out. Well, I appreciate you coming out to join us here at the home show and we've enjoyed meeting a lot of the people and answering some of their questions and hopefully if you guys have any questions out there like rick said go to retirehour.com and you can submit that question and we'd love to answer it and send you a small gift for you submitting that question thanks for being with us hi everybody welcome back into retire hour this is a special episode of retire hour live we are at the 2024 home show at century two i'm here with jenna moody paralegal with item and law firm we're going to talk about some of your estate planning questions that you've submitted to us here at our retire hour booth are you ready jenna i'm ready let's do this excellent our first question comes to us from george c he wants to know uh, how long do i need to serve in the military to get va benefits well, you needed to have served at least 90 days of active duty, and then you needed to have served at least one of those days during a wartime period. So we're talking World War II, we're talking Vietnam, Korean War, and actually, um, we are actually still in the Persian Gulf War right now, uh, even though you know, it ended a long time ago. Technically, it actually has not been uh, ended for, by presidential proclamation. So anybody serving uh, since I think, believe it's 1990 is still wow. technically uh, serving in, during that wartime period. Wow, so, interesting. Yeah, so as long as you have served one day during an active wartime period and there's been 90 days of active service, then you are eligible uh, for a VA, uh, VA benefits. And you also need to have had an other than dishonorable discharge. So any, any discharge that's um, other than dishonorable, then you can also apply for benefits. So you're with Eidelman Law Firm. So you're a state planning team. How do you get involved with VA benefits? How can they get connected with those services through you? Well, there's a lot of, you know, our clients that come to us that, you know, they're in that retirement phase. There's a lot of veterans that, you know, are from that Vietnam War era. And they're trying to figure out, like, how do I maintain my retirement with all of my VA benefits? How do these benefits pass to my spouse if something happens to me? There's a lot of questions that, you know, people come to us about that have to do with the VA. And so um, I'm a veteran myself. And so I, you know, I'm very passionate about making sure that I have some of the information for our veterans to give to them. Um, and we have a lot of resources where we can send people to get the information they need, fill out the forms that they need so that they can either get new benefits or make sure that their spouses get benefits, you know, after they pass. Good. So our next question that we got dropped off at the Retire Hour booth, this comes to us from Curtis L. Curtis wants to know, can I upgrade my military discharge for VA benefits? So, yeah, so going back to, you know, what I said a little bit ago, um, you can upgrade. So say you got a general discharge for, you know, some reason, there are ways to actually upgrade your discharge to an honorable so that you can get more VA benefits than what you might be entitled to, you know, with a other than honorable. And so um, there's just, again, it's paperwork. You got to do the paperwork. There's guidelines that have to be followed, but it's a pro it's a simple, fairly simple process that we can help people through so that they can get the benefits that they need. Excellent. Today is actually military day at the home show. So we had a few extra military people yeah. uh, come by. You are uh, a veteran yourself, correct? Absolutely. Yes, I am. Absolutely. Yep. U.S. Navy. Go Navy. <laughs> Very good. All right. We got a couple more here. All right, so we had this one dropped off uh, yesterday. I was actually here for this one. Uh, mm -hmm. Sherry W., she wants to know, uh, why should I put property in a trust? Well, putting property into a trust, especially, I believe yesterday she was talking about a lot of farmland. She was talking about, um, you know, my family's got a lot of land. I don't know if I should just leave it to my kids, you know, through a transfer on death. Or I don't know if I should, you know, really just put everything into a trust. And something that I always, you know, I'm always around Gerald, you know, our lead attorney. And he tells people that a lot of times when you're putting family land 
when you're dealing with that much acreage, it can get really confusing when it starts going to multiple members of the family. And all of a sudden you've got three generations later, nobody really understands what they have and it gets very confusing very quickly when you get a lot of land in place. So putting it into a trust actually safeguards that land for future generations to know this is what we have. This is, you know, how we're going to continue to pass it generation to generation. It's just really a, a good way to protect uh, land for future generations. That's that's fascinating, and I'm sure that uh, uh, you guys, as, as either the paralegal or Gerald, our estate planning attorney, I'm sure that you uh, provide some helpful information to the financial advisors themselves when Absolutely. they're in meetings. Absolutely, yeah. Gerald's always in the appointments. You know, when they call him in to ask those kinds of questions. Fantastic. Uh, we have another question here. This comes from Patty W. Sorry, Patty M. Patty M. Uh, sorry about that, Patty. You uh, you dropped off this question to our retire hour booth. You wanted to know, can I change an irrevocable trust? Irrevocable sounds unchangeable, but uh, Jenna, what do you think here? Yeah, so irrevocables are basically that. They are irrevocable. Um, you know, Gerald will talk to people about if they are, you know, if they have an irrevocable trust, then you're kind of stuck within those terms, um, but there are ways that some attorneys can take a look at it and see if there's some way to kind of um, wiggle some, have some wiggle room if they need it. Uh, but the whole point of having an irrevocable is so that the terms are followed per the letter of the trust. Um, and so if I think this person, you know, was really wanting to change it, yeah, but an irrevocable is just that it's it's not meant to be changed. Goes to show the importance of having an updated estate plan. Absolutely. How often do you think people should update that? We get that question all the time. All the time, all the time. People are always asking, how often should I even have that looked at? And Gerald will tell people about every two to three years, you want to have it looked at, make sure that the laws haven't changed. If there's any language that needs to be updated, you know, then also some people are changing their trustees. Some people are changing their beneficiaries. It's always just a good idea to have it looked at. Absolutely. Jenna, it was great to have you on. Thank you for thank joining you. this special episode of Retire thank Hour you. Live, yeah. the 2024 Home Show. Uh, thank you to those of you that uh, dropped off your questions to our booth. If you'd like to submit questions to be featured on our show, you can do so at retirehour.com. For estate planning questions, head on to itemandlawfirm.com, and uh, people like Jenna can help you out over there. So thank you to tuning in, and uh, please submit those questions. We'll give you a piece of free swag uh, for doing so. So thank you. Welcome, everybody, back into a special episode of Retire Hour Live. I'm Josiah Ray, hosting this special segment. We are at the 2024 Home Show at Century 2. I'm joined here by Mr. Corey Hebert of Market Medicare Advisors. We are going to answer some Retire Hour submitted questions that you have specifically to Medicare. Corey, are you ready to get started? Oh, absolutely. Let's go. Sounds good. Our first question was submitted to us by Edna S. Edna wants to know, what is the effect on TRICARE for life? Oh man, TRICARE and Medicare. Uh, so number one, just uh, this is uh, something that a lot of people are confused about whenever they come into my office. They, they come into my office and they say, Corey, I'm about to turn 65, but I have TRICARE. I don't need Medicare, do I? Uh, the answer is a resounding yes, you do need Medicare. And it's a little weird to think about, so watch my words when I say this. Whenever you turn 65, you are no longer eligible for TRICARE. You now become eligible only for TRICARE for life. So it does transfer over from just that standard TRICARE to TRICARE for life. Now the very first requirement, whenever you read TRICARE for life, it says must have Medicare Part A and Part B. So Josiah, why? Well, why are these people being kicked off of TRICARE and moved on to TRICARE for Life? How does that change their coverage? TRICARE for Life is not intended to be a primary form of insurance. TRICARE for Life is intended to be a secondary form of insurance and pay after a primary, in this case, Medicare, pays first. It's good to have you guys around at Market Advisory Group. We can, uh, we can really help you... Uh 
or we can really help people that meet with us, I should say, chime in with some of these Medicare points. So appreciate that, Corey. Ready for our next question here? Yeah, absolutely. All, All right. right. Our next question comes for us comes to us from Kurt H. Kurt stopped by our booth and dropped off this question. My spouse is 62. I'm 70. I'm on Medicare and Social Security. When my wife is eligible, what is the best move? Oh man, I, I love this question. This is uh, fantastic. Uh, and it's a little weird to think about because whenever we're talking about Medicare, it is a completely different ball game than we're dealing with a company's insurance. You are a married couple. You may be used to making insurance decisions together You've always sat down in the fall and you've talked with your spouse about what is our best move going to be whenever it comes to, to insurance decisions. And uh, in the case for, for what was name again? Kurt. Kurt. And, and Kurt, in the case for you and your wife, uh, this is the best piece of advice I have for you. Your wife should not walk into Medicare and think that she knows exactly what she's doing because she's going to do exactly what was right for you. Medicare is a very individualized system. And if you're making decisions based on what was best for friends or family, your neighbor down the street, or even your spouse, you're not making the best decision for you. And this is your insurance that you worked as an American taxpayer to have access to whenever you turn 65. These are your tax dollars at work for your insurance, not what's best for spouse, neighbor, friends, family. Absolutely. I'm sure you guys at Market Medicare Advisors deal with couples all the time that have different situations between them. And You've got to navigate those. Yeah, and, and just I, I tell this story to all of my clients, but I, I can't reiterate how true this is. The best part about my job is uh, I have, I'm blessed to have all four of my grandparents still with me. And it's really funny because I, I help all of them out with their Medicare. And anytime I get them together, uh, there's always the same argument of, well, I have the best insurance. Well, I have the best insurance. And it's it's really funny for me because I sit in the background and I know they all have very different plans, but I wouldn't change a single one of their plans because they all have what is best for their particular situation. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, let's keep on going. Our next question comes to us, comes to us from Joff R. Joff wants to know, what is the best way for self-employed people to obtain reasonable medical and dental insurance? Oh, I love this question. Uh, this is perfect. Here at Market Medicare Advisors, yeah, although our name may hint that we only do Medicare, there are so many other forms of insurance that we help people out with. Uh, so I, I'm leaning towards that this uh, question is coming from somebody that may not quite be 65 yet, a general insurance question. And that's when we're going to start looking at toward the marketplace, also known as the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, all words for the, the same exact program. So whenever we're dealing with a self-employed uh, individual, uh, number one, if it's just you working for the company, marketplace is going to be where, where we want to go. Uh, and in terms of what we can do in the marketplace, it's completely dependent on what our income looks like as to what options we're going to have be available for us. So uh, a little bit of a loaded question, but this is not the type of question that I individually am going to want to answer. This is the type of the perfect scenario where we're going to want Joshua Sequora in that office. And whenever you're getting paid uh, for your business ventures, where's that money going? Is it going to your LLC? Is it going to a, a sole proprietorship, a partnership? How are we reporting that income? Uh, because how you report your income is going to drastically change what type of plans are available for you on the open market. Uh, financial planning, you know, when should I take some distributions? The, the drastic effect that taking a distribution on December 31st 
versus January 1st can have on your year of insurance premiums can't be understated. And uh, I feel for any marketplace insurance agent that doesn't have the type of tax and financial people surrounding them that I do, because it makes our job that much easier that all that information is readily available. Very well said, very well said. Are you ready to tackle our next question here? Let's get after it. All right, it. here we go. This one comes to us from Steve W. Steve wants to know, uh, I need help with Medicare sign-up and Medicare coverage. What should I do? I'm sure you have the answer there, Corey. <laughs> Steve, Steve, buddy. The most important thing, the bit of information that I'm going to have for you is that uh, regardless of what any agent tries to do, any private website is going to be opinionated. They're going to have a way that they like to do their Medicare and you need to play by their rules and take their word for truth. Steve, as you're approaching Medicare age, if you're looking for information, you need to look for that information. If you're online, Medicare.gov is going to be the place you want to go. That's the only source of information that, that we like to trust. Uh, find your local agent. Whether that be us here at Market Medicare Advisors or another tr trusted source, don't let these phone companies call in, talk to you for 15 minutes and have you signed up for something. Sit down with somebody, talk about your doctors, your prescriptions and what your healthcare needs are. But most importantly for you, Steve, your biggest question is when? When do I need to start this Medicare planning? When's too early and when's too late? The general rule of thumb with Medicare is you want to sit down with somebody three months before the month you turn 65. Steve, what that's going to do, that's going to give you the ability to have a full understanding of Medicare so that by the time you need to make these decisions, you don't need anybody else telling you what to do. You have all the information you need to put yourself in a sound plan. Well, absolutely. Corey, thank you so much for joining us for this special edition of Retire Hour Live. Retire Hour is complete retirement education every week. We love answering listener questions that you have submitted to us, maybe right here at the home show, live 2024, maybe next year even. Uh, but if you want to submit a question to be featured on the show, go to retirehour.com. If you want to get in touch with us, you can call 833-888-HOUR, or that's 833-888-4687. For anything else, Medicare, Get in touch with marketmedicareadvisors.com or visit us online at marketadvisorygroup.com. Feel free to come submit a question, get a free piece of swag for doing so. Thank you so much for joining us today. Unless otherwise indicated, all client and prospect names mentioned on this show have been changed to protect the identities of the individuals discussed. Investment advisory services are offered through Foundations Investment Advisors, LLC, an SEC-registered investment advisor. The content provided is intended for informational and educational purposes only. The views, statements, and opinions expressed herein are those of the individual speakers and not necessarily those of Foundations and its affiliates. The information contained herein does not constitute an offer to sell any securities or represent an expressed or implied opinion or endorsement of any specific investment opportunity, offering, or issuer. Any discussion of performance or returns are not indicative of future results. Each individual investor situation is different and any ideas provided may not be appropriate for your particular circumstances. Foundations only transacts business in the states where it is registered or excluded or exempt from registration requirements. Registration as an investment advisor is not an endorsement of the firm by security regulators and does not mean the advisor has achieved a specific level of skill or ability. No legal or tax advice is provided. Always consult with a tax professional. Legal services are offered by Eidelman Law Firm. Tax services offered by Market Tax Services. Market Advisory Group does not provide legal or tax advice. Any comments regarding safe and secure investments and guaranteed income streams refer only to fixed insurance products. They do not in any way refer to investment advisory products. Rates and guarantees provided by insurance products and annuities are subject to the financial strength of the issuing insurance company, not guaranteed by any bank or the FDIC. The guest commentators featured in this show are not investment advisor representatives of foundations and do not provide advisory services. Market Advisory Group does have several investment advisor representatives that can provide such services. This is not endorsed or affiliated with any U.S. government agency, the Social Security Administration, or associated with any federal Medicare program. We do not offer every plan available in your area. Any information we provide is limited to those plans we do offer in your area. Please contact Medicare.gov or 1-800-MEDICARE to get information on all of your options. A Roth conversion may not be suitable for your situation. The primary goal in converting retirement assets into a Roth IRA is to reduce the future tax liability on the distributions you take in retirement or on the distributions of your beneficiaries. The information provided is to help you determine whether or not a Roth IRA conversion may be appropriate for your particular circumstances. Please review your retirement savings, tax, and legacy planning strategies with your legal slash tax advisor to be sure a Roth IRA conversion fits into your planning strategies. All rights reserved.